Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar titled, Who is a Worker and Understanding Apportionment of Liability? My name is Hannah Staunton. I'm a lawyer at WorkCover Queensland, and I'll be your host for today's webinar, which is actually our final webinar for 2020. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to Queensland's elders, past, present and emerging. We thank the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia for their ongoing custodianship of land, waters and community. Today's webinar will run for approximately one hour with some time for questions at the end. If you need to leave a bit earlier, this session will be recorded and we will send a link to the recording out via email by early next week. It will also be uploaded to WorkCover Queensland's YouTube channel and on our website. Please feel free to submit any questions during the webinar using the panel on the right hand side of your screen. We will aim to answer some of your questions after the main presentation if time permits. And just a friendly reminder that any questions answered or advice provided today by WorkCover Queensland or Heed Fern Hall and Hall Lawyers is general information only and should not be taken as legal advice. I'd like to introduce our guest presenters for today's session. First, we have Kim Kavanagh, a director at Heed Fern and Hall Lawyers. Kim is particularly interested in litigation, dispute resolution and property law and assists clients from their Toowoomba and Warwick offices. Our second presenter is Patrick Hall or Pat Hall, whose birthday it is today, also a director from Heed, Burn and Hall Lawyers. Pat has extensive experience in dispute resolution and litigation and also has an interest in school law and employment law. Pat assists clients from their offices in Toowoomba, Warwick and Roma. I will now hand you over to Kim and Pat for today's presentation. Uh, thanks, uh, Hannah. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to share these few thoughts uh, with you this morning. Um, it's probably fair to say that uh, uh, that Kim and my uh, most significant uh, uh, professional efforts relate to to our work as part of the work co work cover uh, panel lawyer team. And there would be quite a few of you, I'm sure, who may well have uh, had some involvement with us over the years. And it's certainly in that context that we're sharing these thoughts with you, uh, with you this morning. Um, what uh, the, the subject I'm going to cover this morning is uh, the the issue of whether or not a worker is an employee or an independent contractor. And I've broken, my present, broken up my presentation into four general areas. First of all, what are we talking about? Why does it matter? How can you tell the difference between an employee and an independent contractor? And then what can you do about it? So if we just move on to the, the first slide about what are we talking about? Well, all of us as uh, people, either as business owners or people involved in business, uh, generally understand what an employee is or who an employee is. An employee, of course, can be full-time, part-time or casual, may work for more than one employer. And essentially, uh, an employee is an individual who works for and in your business. Whereas an independent contractor may be an individual, but also uh, might be a partnership or a company. And in, an independent contractor uh, runs his or her own business and applies that business to help your business. So rather than being an individual who works in your business, it's a, a person or an entity that applies its business to help your business. Now, why does all of this matter? Well, it, it matters because different legal obligations flow from each relationship, which uh, I'm sure each of you are aware. Are aware. And I just wanted to, to move uh, quickly through uh, the, the major areas of concern and where problems arise. The first one uh, relates to the, the provisions of the Fair Work Act and also the uh, rights and obligations from the various uh, uh, employment awards. Uh, an employee has access uh, to uh, the rights and protections provided by the Fair Work Act and the various industry awards, but an independent contractor does not. 
So the difficulty there is, of course, if you have as someone that you think is an independent contractor and they turn out to be uh, an employee, uh, you may find yourself in a situation where there's an unexpected uh, protection from an unfair dismissal uh, situation uh, or some sort of unexpected award protection and there may be the benefit uh, from the national employment standards that you weren't counting on. A similar situation can arise with respect to the uh, taxation legislation, as you'll all appreciate, that there are different uh, employer taxation obligations uh, that apply to an employer rather than to uh, an independent contractor. And if that uh, situation is mixed up, then you can uh, unexpectedly uh, find yourself in a situation where there's an obligation to pay uh, withholding tax, for example, uh, in circumstances where there may not be any capacity to recover those monies uh, from the, uh, the worker who turns out to be an employee rather than an independent contractor. And the difficulty with all of these matters is that sometimes these relationships are long term and uh, if an error is made at the outset, as years pass, the financial exposure can be quite crippling. Uh, also with respect to the taxation legislation, um, uh, ATO penalties, uh, penalties can also apply. The third relevant area is in the area of superannuation. Uh, the Superannuation Guarantee Administration Act provides for the compulsory payment of superannuation and the definition of employee in section 12 of that act is as follows, and I'll just read it out. Uh, if a person works under a contract that is wholly or principally for the labour of the person, the person is an employee of the other party to the contract. So essentially, even if you have someone who otherwise is an independent contractor, but that person principally pr provides labour to your business, then that person is considered an employee for the purpose of the superannuation le legislation. And so even though that person might otherwise be uh, an independent contractor, there's an obligation on your part to pay compulsory superannuation to that person. Now, again, that becomes a problem if the years pass, the error is made at the outset, and suddenly you may find yourself uh, facing some significant financial exposure. The next area, and the one with which uh, we're probably most uh, familiar, is under the Works Compensation Rehabilitation Act. Now, uh, under, the, uh, under the provisions of the Workers' Compensation Legislation, a worker is defined by reference to the taxation legislation and it's essentially a worker equates to an employee. Now under section 48 of the Act, uh, an employer must ensure that each worker is covered by a work cover policy. Uh, if, there's, if there's a breach of section 48, uh, section 51 provides that there's a, a, a monetary penalty for having that wrong. But more importantly, perhaps under section 57 of the Act, a work cover is able to recover from the employer amount, the amount of the unpaid premium as well as a penal, penalty uh, up to 100% of the unpaid premium and that's all bad enough but the situation gets really ugly as uh, under section 57 work cover, uh, if work cover has paid compensation or damages for the injury and the employer is in breach of section 48, that means if the employer doesn't have a policy in relation to that employee, then uh, work cover is also able to recover the amount of the payment together with a penalty equal to 50% of the payment. Now happily work cover has some scope to waive and reduce that penalty, but that can be a really uh, awkward situation uh, as you'll see later. The next area I want to talk about is just with respect to general common law liabilities. Uh, and why this is relevant is that generally, with some rare but significant exceptions, an employer is vicariously liable for the acts or omissions of its employees. So that if your employee uh, makes a mistake, uh, does something wrong, then generally speaking, the employer bears responsibility for that error or that negligence. Generally speaking, a principal contractor, again with some significant exceptions, 
will not be vicariously liable for the actual omissions of an independent contractor. So that if your independent contractor makes a, a, is negligent or makes a mistake, makes an error, generally speaking, as the person who engaged that independent contractor, uh, you're not or not, at least not always vicariously liable uh, for that error. However, significant problems arise uh, where in the context of a workplace injury, when the injured party was thought to be an independent contractor but proves to be an employee and there's no work cover policy as we've referred to earlier. But there's also, also problems arise if a person who you thought to be was an employer is in fact, employee is in fact an independent contractor or you thought that for one reason or another your work cover policy might extend to that person and, and that proves not to be the case. You may then find yourself in a situation uh, where someone else in your business uh, is not covered uh, for an injury that happens to him or her, or you find yourself uh, being liable for that loss for one reason or another, where you don't have the uh, correct public liability policy to ensure, uh, to cover uh, that particular situation. So it's important at the outset that you know where you are with the people that are performing work for you, uh, so that you can uh, give yourself the necessary uh, protection that you need. Look, it, it's a bit like the kids playing on the trampoline. Everything's all right until Brian gets a fat lip and then everybody's looking for someone to blame. And it's, it's exactly the same situation here. Now, we, we've been doing this stuff for a long time and, and over those years there have been some real problems. And I've, I've just got a couple of uh, quick instances here I want to uh, spell out for you that come from our horror file. The first one was uh, occurred in the middle of the last drought, not the current drought, but the last one. And uh, we, we had a claim for a rural property owner who came to us. Uh, now this particular person uh, didn't have any employees on the property, but uh, had to leave the property to get work off farm uh, to pay the bills. Now to assist, uh, this person uh, purported to engage a caretaker on an independent contract basis to mind the farm in her absence. Now that all sounds fair, fair enough. This caretaker was a retired person, uh, didn't want any trouble with the tax officer, worked through a, uh, an organisation that provided this kind of assistance and signed up as an, in, as an independent contractor. On the very first morning, this person fell off the back of the quad bike when the owner was showing him around the property and suffered a reasonably serious head injury. This happened in the first hour. No workers' compensation policy. The uh, statutory claim had a value of over $800,000 and Workover made a claim on this person for the uh, full amount of that, uh, of that statutory claim. So as you can imagine, it was a nightmare. Fortunately, we're able to get a very sensible resolution, but I can tell you for that particular owner, it was an absolute nightmare. The other really awkward thing that comes to mind uh, to me uh, uh, that's arisen from confusion in this area. So we had a substantial employer some years ago now who had engaged on an independent contract basis, a workplace health and safety officer. Now this workplace health and safety officer asked to be put on as a, an independent contractor because it assisted him with his taxation issues and also assisted him with some other personal financial issues. So our client, trying to be as helpful as it could, put this person on on that basis. However, uh, the, the uh, business operator sought to end the contract uh, and then the worker then decided that uh, he wasn't a contractor after all, so he brought a, a claim for unfair dismissal, he brought a claim for sham subcontracting and then he brought a work cover claim for psychiatric injury arising from the dispute. Um, the matter was resolved of course but it wasn't, but it was resolved at significant cost to the business even, the whole, even though the whole setup had been instituted in response to the worker's own request. So look, look I appreciate how nuts all that sounds but that's exactly what can happen. And that's why it's so important that you get things right at the beginning. Now, I just want to run through uh, some cases for you now quickly. I don't know how I'm going for time. Well, time goes quickly. 
Um, the first one we want to talk about, and this, this is really the first High Court case or one of the earliest High Court cases that has tried to bring this area of law into the modern era. It's a matter of Stephen and Broadwood's saw milling. And essentially what happens, happened there was Stevens was injured when he was loading logs onto the back of his truck. The fellow driving the dozer uh, lost uh, control of a log and uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, Stevens was injured. Uh, now the issue here was whether or not the dozer driver was an employee of, the, of Broadrib, who was the sawmiller and in charge of the whole outfit, or whether he was an independent contractor. Now, uh, to that point, historically, this issue had been resolved on the basis of who had control of the workplace. And in this particular setup, uh, the sawmiller had in place an overall supervisor, a bloke they referred to as the bush boss. And um, the, uh, oper the dozer operator, Gray, uh, was subject to the direction of the of the bush uh, of the bush boss, but the high court uh, moved away from the traditional view of of how all this worked in this particular case, and it formed the view that it wasn't enough just to have a look at who has control of the workplace. You have to look at it more deeply, and and your assessment has to be more detailed. And in this particular uh, case. They appreciated that whilst the dozer driver was respons responsible to or had to take direction from the bush boss, uh, he owned his own dozer, he had to maintain his own equipment. He, uh, Within certain limits, he had quite a bit of scope as to how he operated his own sort of part of the, of the overall operation. And in that context, the High Court formed the view that the dozer operator was not an employee, but in fact um, was an independent contractor. And because he was an independent contractor, the saw miller was not responsible for his negligence. So this was one of the main early cases uh, where the High Court formed the view that when you're working this out, you've got to look at a broader view of the circumstances. The next, uh, or not the next significant case, but a, a very significant case further along is the matter of Hollis and Babu. Hollis was a, a bicycle courier, and those of you who spent some time in the CBD know what uh, cyclists and uh, scooter drivers can be like in the CBD. Um, we saw one this morning that was made me nervous enough. But anyway, this uh, this fellow Hollis, who funnily enough was also a courier driver himself, but for a competitor. He uh, stepped out of a building in uh, Altamo in Sydney and got hit by a courier. The courier was an independent contractor for Vibu uh, and uh, made sure Hollis was all right and then just pedalled off. So Hollis didn't know who he was, but he knew that he had, uh, uh, he, he knew who he worked for because he had the sign uh, on his shirt that he, it was uh, uh, crisis couriers, that's right. So, uh, Otherwise, he didn't know who this bloke was. So it was important for him to make sure he could get Vabu into the case. Otherwise, he didn't have any access uh, to um, uh, to compensation, he knew, and he was quite badly uh, injured. Now, Vabu formed the view that this bloke was an independent contractor. Vabu had uh, bicycle couriers, car, uh, motor vehicle couriers, and motorcycle couriers, and they set them all up as independent contractors. Um, and so they said, look, Sorry, this bloke got hurt. Not our fault. Got nothing to do with us. He's an independent contractor, and we're not. Uh, we're just not responsible for that. So, what uh, what the high what the high court said? It finally, got to the high court. The high court says, "Well, hang on there, Babu. It's not that easy." And the particular complication here was that some time before this high court case from Hollis, Babu had got as far as the New South Wales Court of Appeal in a case. Uh, brought by the uh, Commissioner of Taxation in relation to their payment of superannuation. And that had been resolved on the basis that Vubu uh, had engaged these people as an independent contractor. However, when, it, when this particular case, this personal injuries case, got to the High Court, uh, the High Court had, was going to have none of that. And what they said at the end of the day, these were the indicia which indicated that uh, the arrangement uh, was actually that of employer and employee. So taking on the approach adopted in Stevenson Broadrib, they looked at all of the uh, 
uh, all of the issues. And it, it's probably worth our while to have a look at these in some detail. First of all, the couriers did not provide any particular skill or labour which required specific uh, qualifications. So they weren't really operating their own business as a sub subcontractor, perhaps as a bricklayer or a carpenter might. They weren't able to uh, uh, develop an independent career as a freelance courier. They couldn't generate any goodwill on their own account. The High Court felt that they, or not felt, thought that they weren't operating their own enterprise. So that's the first thing. The second thing, the control test, whilst not the only test, was still important. And the couriers had little control over the manner of performing their work. Importantly, the couriers were presented to the public and to those using the services as emanations of Vabu. They weren't uh, presented to the world at large as being in any way separate from Vabu. And that proved ultimately to be a very important issue as the law in this uh, area um, has developed over time, bearing in mind that this case was nearly 20 years ago. Um, the High Court helpfully also identified that there was a broader public benefit in companies like Vabu being responsible for the areas for the errors of those that are working for them, because they thought that that might encourage uh, people like or companies like Vabu to put some controls over the way this was being done. Uh, Vabu also managed the courier's finances. The only equipment provided by the bicycle couriers, in particular, was the bicycle which is quite different to Gray in Stevens and Broadrib, where Gray was in fact providing his own bulldozer. In, in Hollis and Vabu, the courier was only providing his push bike. And the High Court properly pointed out that that bike could also be used as a means of personal transportation and recreation in any event. And, uh, and significantly again, uh, Vabu retained a broad general control of the op uh, of the operation and the couriers really had little scope um, for uh, making independent decisions the way the whole thing unfolded. So the High Court in that case formed the view that the relationship was that of employer and employee uh, regardless of the way that Vabu had tried to set it up. So that was in 2001. In 2006, uh, the matter of uh, Boylan nominees and Sweeney and Boylan nominees got to the High Court. Now, in this particular case, um, Sweeney uh, was uh, innocently trying to get a drink at a service station. She opened the door of the fridge, the door came off and struck her on the head and she suffered a pretty nasty injury. Now, the fault with the door had been identified by the owners of the service station that morning. The fridge had been provided by Boylan. Boylan had arranged its refrigeration me mechanic to come and fix it. The refrigeration mechanic came to fix it and something went wrong with the repair. I don't know if he didn't tighten up the bolts or something, but in any event, as a result of the refrigeration mechanic's error, the door came off and hit Mrs Sweeney in the, sh in the head. Now, uh, Mr Sweeney uh, sued Boyle and nominees as the party responsible for the mechanic and responsible for the fridge. Now, the difficulty here was uh, that uh, the um, commono, who was the mechanic, he was set up by Boylan uh, as an independent contractor. And he was an independent contractor uh, in, in, in you would think uh, in, in every way. He, uh, he didn't have a uniform, he didn't have any signs on his truck, he worked for other people, he was, uh, according to himself and also according to Boylan, he was uh, an independent contractor. However, what he did do was that when he provided a report, uh, a repair report, he used one of Boylan's forms he prepared the invoice on behalf of Boylan and gave it to the customer. And he was authorised by uh, Boylan to, uh, to deliver the invoice, but also to accept payment. And that was all done through forms that had uh, Boylan's, the name of Boylan's business on it. And so uh, Mr Sweeney, in the desperate position that, we was, that she was, seeing she had to find someone that she could sue, she claimed that these things were enough to uh, 
uh, give the uh, expectation to the community at large uh, that Comino was actually uh, working for on an, uh, on an employee basis uh, Boylan nominees. The uh, majority of the High Court uh, rejected that and found that uh, he was a, an independent, Comino was an independent contractor and therefore Boylan not, was not responsible for his uh, negligence. However, Justice Kirby, who's a, uh, something of a star of the High Court, he accepted uh, in a dissenting judgment, he accepted that Comino was an independent uh, contractor, but nevertheless, he found that the fact that Boylan allowed Comino to use their uh, particular forms, he found that that was sufficient to uh, mean that Comino effectively represented Boylan and therefore Boylan was responsible, in a, vicariously responsible for any areas, for any errors, I should say, that Comino had made. So it, it's all a bit murky still. Um, the next case uh, I wanted to go through with you is a, a very recent case. It's a, a case of the full bench of the Fair Work Commission, a matter of Gupta and Portia Pacific from April this year. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Mrs Gupta is an Uber Eats operator and she uh, was uh, accessing the Uber Eats app. She was getting some work for Uber Eats. Somehow there'd been a parting of the ways. I'm not sure why. But in any event, Uber Eats denied her access to the app. And uh, she, uh, of course, then was denied access to that work. So she brought a claim on the basis, she essentially brought a claim for unfair, unfair dismissal on the basis that she was effectively an employee of Uber Eats. Now, Uber Eats were having none of that. Uh, they had gone to some trouble to make sure that she was set up as an independent contractor. Uh, the matter went through, through the first uh, through the Fair Work Commission, uh, which found that it was an independent contractor situation, um, and then it went to the full bench of the of the uh, of the Fair Work Commission. Um, now, it it was really the, the facts of this matter were reasonably complex. Um, you know, there were a lot of the indicia from indicia, I should say, from Hollis, that really supported the fact that Uber Eats Uber Eats drivers were employees. <laughs> Excuse me, but there are also some that were quite uh, neutral, and also some that supported the proposition that uh, that they were independent contractors. But in the final analysis, uh, the full bench of the Fair Work Commission accepted that there were mixed indicia, but they found that these three were the most significant in resolving the, the, the situation. Firstly, Uber Eats had no control over when and how long uh, Ms Gupta performed her duties. So while she could sign on to the, app, to the app and could take work, she didn't have to take work. So she had no obligation to work or to select any particular job. So that was the first thing. And you can appreciate that is different from most uh, work situations. The second thing was uh, that when she was logged on, she could also do work from other competitor food, food delivery businesses, or she could also do rideshare work at the same time. And the third thing, and, and quite possibly the mo one of the most one of the more important things, was that she was not presented as an emanation of the Uber Eats business. As, uh, as the courier driver was in Hollis. She had no uniform, <laughs> excuse me, and no logo on the car and no obligation that she, to represent that she was part of the Uber Eats business other than what she needed to identify herself as the Uber Eats person uh, to pick up the food from the particular cafe. <laughs> excuse me again. <laughs> so at the end of the day, the full bench was satisfied uh, that, that um, she was an independent contractor. The last one I wanted to uh, to talk about. Excuse me, is a matter of uh, FX Group and uh, Jared Bennett, <clears throat> and this is a full bench decision. Excuse me again. Yeah. Uh, full the full bench of the Fair Work Commission from the Friday before last. That's how recent this one is. Now uh, Bennett 
was in a sales role in a business that provided uh, voice, data printing management and other technology based services. And before he started with FX, they had agreed that he would, uh, be, uh, he would undertake this role clearly as an independent contractor. So this wasn't something that, that was accidentally uh, entered into or uh, there was any confusion about it. These uh, uh, parties had uh, purposefully and intentionally uh, entered into the, into the arrangement on that basis. Now, uh, Bennett was an experienced business person who had had a, a good business education. And so um, when he, uh, well, what happened was uh, uh, FX wanted to, to change the arrangement and put him on as a full-time employee and he objected to that. And so FX then sought to terminate his contract. And so Bennett then brought a claim for unfair dismissal on the basis that despite what they had agreed, that he was an employee all the way along. Uh, it's a bit like that that happened in that client uh, with that client of mine, and I can tell you how galling that was at that stage. So, um, what FX had argued was that that this fellow knew exactly what he was getting into. He had a, a good business education. He was an experienced businessman, and so it, it would simply be unfair uh, to uh, treat him now as an employee rather than as an independent contact, contractor. Importantly, the full bench highlighted the fact that the parties can't please themselves uh, what they agree to in the sense that by calling it a, by a different name doesn't change the actual substance of the agreement. And so when they looked at the totality of the evidence, they found that was in fact a, a, an employment relationship. And they indicated that the effect of the party's pre-dispute understanding of the relationship will only change the result if the indicia are, are otherwise evenly balanced. <coughs> um, so uh, that was a, a, an unfortunate <coughs> uh, outcome as far as FX was concerned. So uh, that brings us to, <coughs> excuse me again, uh, what, what we can do about it. <coughs> and first of all, the, the first thing that we need to consider is the whole picture. You need to have a look at exactly what's going on and you particularly need to ask yourself, um, is this person, uh, am I presenting this person somehow as an emanation of my business? Have I got control over everything that he does or she does? And <clears throat> we need to look at all of those issues that were, uh, were dealt with in that Hollis case. If it's your plan to engage an independent contractor, it's far and away uh, much safer to engage a company rather than an individual because a company can never be an employee. And if your options uh, to engage an independent contractor are limited to an individual, you need to take all necessary steps to make sure that, <clears throat> that there's a separation between your business and the business of the independent contractor because essentially what you'll need to argue is that that person has a business which is separate to my business. So avoid having the independent contractor wear your uniform or otherwise personally identify with your business. Useful to have a written agreement which sets out the party's understanding of the arrangements. Now that won't resolve the issue if there are other substantive uh, questions about it but if the other uh, issues are evenly balanced uh, the written agreement uh, will uh, win the day. Perhaps most importantly, you need to make sure that all of your insurances are in order. Now at this day and age, there's absolutely no excuse for not having a work cover policy. Even if you have the basic policy, it's very cheap. Uh, and if somehow your independent contractor turns out to be an employee, then the scope of your dispute with work cover is limited to the amount of the premium. And so you're no worse off essentially than you would have been anyway but you do have that protection. Really the worst situation here is if you find yourself with an independent contractor who turns out to, to be an employee and you get injured at work, he get, or she gets injured at work. But you also need to make sure that the public liability policy similarly covers the situation that you think you have or also the situation that you have if your understanding is, incor is incorrect. It's also important to be sensible when you're making accommodations for people who want to do work for you. 
Uh, people are very helpful at the outset of an arrangement, but a bit like Brian when he gets the fat lip, he's not so happy about it at the end. Um, and the tide can change very quickly when you make uh, arrangements to um, accommodate uh, someone who's going to do some work for you and their particular needs. And the last thing I just need to stress is be particularly careful about superannuation because very regularly you'll have a, an independent contractor for whom you are actually required to pay superannuation and that needs to be taken into account in the contract payments. Um, look, that's probably all I've got, uh, uh, Hannah. Uh, I'm sorry that took a little bit longer than I thought, uh, but thanks. I'd, I'd now like to uh, pass over to Kim, uh, thanks, one Dad. of my partners. Thanks, Kim. Good evening for a bit of my time, but I'll let you off because Th it's your birthday thank today. Thank you, Kim. One. So we'll, we'll move on to uh, an area that, that is somewhat in line with um, the issues that Pat was discussing. So arising from whether somebody is a worker or a, an employee, rather, or an independent contractor, um, then has an influence on what duties um, a party will owe them as an employer or as a principal contractor. And that leads on to the potential apportionment of liability in claims where there's multiple parties involved. We're going to focus on the construction industry um, because typically, of course, it's an area where you have multiple um, contractors um, working in overlapping systems of work. Um, it's best to sort of have a look at first um, the, the employer. The employer is a non-delegable duty of care to its employees. Um, this non-delegable duty arises because courts recognise essentially that an employee is reliant upon an employer to provide a safe system of work. Um, it's a special relationship where the employee is vulnerable and therefore um, it's the employer who has a duty to ensure that a, a reasonable care is taken by the contractors it engages and it will be liable for the negligence. Um, as an employer, you just can't simply delegate your responsibility of a, providing a safe system of work to another party. However, the duty of a principal contractor, of course, is generally more confined, and as Pat pointed out, um, the different legal obligations are flow um, from um, the subject of the relationship. So in order to demonstrate this, we'll take a look at some of the key cases um, with a bit of a focus on construction. And we'll take a look at when a principal contractor is not liable, uh, is liable, the apportionment of liability will then review the circumstances that give rise to a duty of care um, on a principal contractor and the relevant factors in the apportionment of liability applied by the uh, courts and we'll just have some final comments at the end. So we'll kick it off by going back to Stevens and Broderick. Um, as Tap pointed out in that case the court decided that both Stevens and Gray uh, were independent contractors uh, the court considered that uh, both Gray and Stevens uh, were both experienced and competent contractors. They were experienced in the role that they were carrying out, had done the work before. Um, and the court had to just had to consider, well, in those circumstances, what is the duty owed by Rodrib in that circumstance as a principal contractor rather than that of an employer? And essentially, the High Court um, identified uh, that the duty of a principal contractor was to use reasonable care to avoid unnecessary risk of injury, uh, which in this case was to engage experienced independent contractors who were competent of determining their own systems of work. And it was his duty to ensure or to supervise and coordinate the activities um, if the nature of the work required it. In this case, as the parties were working essentially in the same area, there was some requirement to supervise and coordinate, which uh, Broderib did so by having in place the Bush boss and therefore the, the High Court said well in that case Broderib is not liable for the negligent actions of Gray who is an experienced and competent in, uh, independent contractor uh, capable of taking care of his own system of work. Um, we'll move straight on into latent contracting or latent contractors which is the next case it's typical of a larger construction site We've got the facts set out there and as you can see there's multiple um, principal head contractors and subcontractors involved. Essentially you have Leighton as the principal who engaged Downview, who engaged Still and Cook, who engaged Fox and Stewart. Fox was an independent contractor and was unfortunately injured quite seriously um, when a pumping pipe struck him on the head. The system of work was devised by Stewart and Sill. Um, each of those were independent contractors um, and Fox then sought damages for his injuries from Leighton, Downview and Stewart. The High Court confirmed that the principal contractor's duties 
uh, to workers is just not the same as a duty um, owed by an employer to its employees. It again applied the reasoning from Stevens and Broadrib to essentially say that the, uh, the principal is not liable for damage caused by the negligent failure of an independent contractor, so long as there was no failure on its part to take reasonable care in the employment of that independent contractor who was competent to control their own systems of work. So the High Court determined in that case that there was no breach of duty on the part of Leighton nor Downby, uh, and uh, Stewart uh, was left uh, to essentially satisfy the judgment. Uh, now Stewart himself was an employee of another company, um, and uh, judgment was entered against Stewart. Um, the next case of Sydney Water Corp and Abramovic um, is slightly different, but very useful uh, for identifying other duties. Um, Abramovic, um, fortunately suffered lung disease due to inhalation of silica while carrying out sandstone drilling work. He was employed by Harnett and uh, they undertook the work at uh, sites that were controlled and operated by Sydney Water Corp. Now Sydney Water Corp also had employees of its own that un undertook similar work um, at those sites. Um, the, the issue was is that essentially Harnett, the employer, um, was definitely negligent, failed to provide any PPE um, to Abramovic and Abramovic was unaware of the, the risk of injury. Um, however, there was, there was problems with recovery against Abramovic, so essentially the claim was brought against Sydney Water Corp um, in the hope that there might be able to be um, some finding of liability against the principal contractor in that circumstance. Um, while Sydney Water Corp uh, did have some level of supervision and did know of the risk of injury, the High Court said that ultimately it did not retain control of the system of work and it was not acting uh, in uh, the position of an employer and it was not liable as a principal contractor for the negligent system of work adopted by Harnett as the employer of Abramovic. Um, it's a really unfortunate situation um, but um, that was the case. So in relation to uh, some of the comments in that case, what is quite helpful that arose out of that case is this um, a set of um, circumstances that the High Court identified that might give rise to a duty of care on the part of a principal contractor and they're just set out uh, there at the bottom. I'll just go through them because they really are quite helpful. Um, essentially a, a principal contractor uh, may find itself uh, liable and, and does have a duty of care where it directs the manner of performance of the work, uh, where the nature of the work requires coordination of activities, where there is special knowledge of a risk um, or, of injury which the employer does not have, or where the principal is in a position to take precautions and the employer cannot do so, uh, or where the principal has knowledge that the employer is failing to take steps to alleviate the risk of injury. Um, or those those five circumstances um, are quite helpful, I think, in identifying the, uh, the duties that can arise on the part of a principal contractor. We have a look at the next one of Valley and Bell, Valley Homes and Bell. Again, this is a quite standard setup on a construction site building, a, a home construction. Valley Homes is the principal contractor, engaged multiple independent contractors, including A quality bricklaying. Um, so it's a standard construction site. We have chippies and brickies working side by side. Um, Bell suffered injury when he fell from scaffolding. That was compromised by a chippy essentially, I think before lunch, um, one of the chippies needed a few uh, sections of the scaffolding, so they took a few bits out, um, which is unfortunate for Bell. However, Bell actually knew that that had occurred. Um, so there is some notice of that. And now what the court had to look at was to what extent did the principal contract, contractor's duty uh, extend to insofar as coordination and supervision of the independent contractors on that site? And they resolved that the duty did not extend so far as to require constant supervision. The independent contractors were competent. There was sufficient um, scaffolding on the site. Uh, there was no need for them to be um, watching these uh, where independent contractors operate side by side in order to discharge their duty. So they were found not liable for Bell's injuries. Um, the next one is a case of McGlashan. Um, this one I think is really helpful, just, to, just going on from what Pat described earlier, um, of the consequences of, of getting it right and wrong as to whether a worker is an employee or an independent contractor. 
Ladoran Reefing engaged McGlashan, who was trading in a partnership. So it wasn't a PDYLTD, and essentially it was a partnership with his son, I believe, to provide labouring services. He was quite an experienced labourer. He wasn't a tradesman, but he had his substantial experience. And what occurred was Ladoran had uh, uh, some leaking, um, I think, roof sections. They'd closed down the operations on the construction site and they called McGlashan and said, look, can you go in and take care of these leaks? Um, McGlashan was um, going to do that himself, um, which required use of a ladder. Lodoran was aware that he was going to go do that work himself and left it to McGlashan. And unfortunately, um, McGlashan didn't tie off the ladder. There was a big gust of wind that blew him off the ladder and he suffered injuries. Um, the court determined that, um, or a number of reasons that McGlashan was an independent contractor and then was left to consider whether the principal contractor, um, Lodoran, was liable. Um, essentially, the court said that they are not liable um, as they had taken steps to hire an experienced independent contractor um, who was then capable of determining um, his own system of work. Um, McGlashan was entitled to decide that the, the performance of the work couldn't be done um, uh, by himself and he, he could have said no. The court acknowledged that this, this did have the result of uh, him not being paid um, but that was entirely his decision and therefore um, Lodoran was not liable for his injuries. You can see that the reverse situation had Lodoran been found to be an employer would have resulted in entirely the opposite decision here and I suspect that the principal cause of the claim against QBE was that McGlashan may not have held sufficient or appropriate insurance to cover his own um, disastrous outcome from injuries at work. Um, so this is just a prime example of, of where if you get it wrong, it can just have disastrous consequences. Um, so we'll move on to the next decision of KBIC. Um, it's interesting in this case, I might go through all the circumstances because there's a number of um, companies involved, but it's interesting in this case that neither the principal contractor nor the employer were found liable. Uh, the nature of the accident that occurred was highly specific to a particular time and place and was considered only within the control of the plaintiff himself and the subcontractor, um, Calcano, um, who exercised substantive control over his activities on the site. Um, it involved a, a rainy day and, and using a wet uh, wooden uh, platform, which resulted in a slip and fall. Um, again, the court found that the principal contractor um, on that site, um, being Daycorp, had engaged competent independent contractors who were capable of controlling their own systems of work. They were not liable for the failure of that system of work. Um, Calcano was held liable and the plaintiff himself was also found to have contributed to his own injuries. Um, moving on to uh, Burnie Port Authority, while not a typical construction case, nonetheless quite important. Um, in this case, Bernie owned, uh, Bernie Port Authority owned the building, um, wanted to take out, uh, undertake some construction works, it resolved to do so by hiring uh, a number of independent contractors and using its own employees. Uh, one of the parts of the construction required welding works um, which were carried out next to flammable materials and uh, the ensuing fire destroyed the goods that General Jones had stored in the building. Uh, the court determined uh, when reviewing the duty of care owed by the Port Authority that because uh, they had control over the building and they had introduced a dangerous activity, that General Jones uh, was a vulnerable party by proximity, um, that this gave rise to a non-delegable duty of care. So the Port Authority was a principal contractor, but was found to have owed a non-delegable duty of care, and that resulted in it being uh, responsible for the negligence of the independent contractors that it engaged. Um, and, uh, and so that had that outcome in that case. Moving on to coats and concrete panels. Um, we're going to move into cases uh, as Bernie was. This is a, a case, Bernie was a case, of course, where the principal contractor was found liable. Again, Coates Concrete Panels is an example where the principal contractor uh, is found liable. Uh, again, we've got multiple contractors on the site carrying out overlapping roles. Um, Coates was injured when the trench collapsed on him. 
uh, in this case, the subcontractor and the employer had knowledge of the risk of trench collapse and failed to follow the site safety plan. The principal contractor on the site also had knowledge of the risk and was also aware that the independent contractors on the site were not adhering to that site safety plan. So it, because of the principal contractor's uh, retention of control over the site and their knowledge of the risk of injury and their knowledge of the risk because of the non-compliance of the site safety plan by its own independent contractors, the principal contractor was found liable together with the employer and the subcontractor capable constructions um, who were obviously negligent for their failures as well. Um, unfortunately, in that case, there was no discussion about the apportionment of liability, um, but we can all um, have a guess as to what the outcome might have been. Uh, the next case of Love and North Goonyella, uh, again, not, not quite a construction case, but again, helpful when looking at uh, circumstances where uh, a principal contractor may be found to have a non-delegable duty of care. In this case, North Goonyella was the principal contractor and occupier, um, had contracted with numerous parties for the supply of labour, um, had virtually complete control over all workers on the site, and in that case was found therefore to have a non-delegable duty, as essentially it acted as an employer um, to, those, um, to those workers on its site and they were therefore liable and vicariously liable for the negligence of other independent contractors which resulted in injury um, to love in that case. All right, the next few cases will finally give us an idea of the potential apportionments that courts might make um, when looking at uh, these multiple party claims. So Hussain and Unity Grammar, comparable to the circumstances of uh, Burnie Port Authority, the college engaged um, Binner as principal contractor to carry out gas works at the college. Binner contracted with Five Star and Enma and Elgas and Cohen to carry out various aspects of the project. Um, Enma negligently installed a regulator and failed to obtain a compliance plate and this, this negligence of Enma led to a disastrous outcome when the gas vented from the regulator some time later, um, causing an explosion that injured Hussein. Essentially, all of the parties, Elgas, Five Star and Cohen, failed to identify um, that there was a lack of a compliance plate and, and this was a, a critical component um, leading to the explosion. The court found that um, Binner had control of the premises um, in terms of organising the, the works. It had introduced a dangerous substance, so you can see here the similarities to Burning Port Authority. Hussain was a vulnerable party. He was um, essentially on there as um, a caretaker and um, I think a janitor, but of course the students themselves as well would have been in a similar position. Because of those factors, the, court, uh, the, the Supreme Court of New South Wales determined that Binner owed Hussain a non-delegable duty of care and it was therefore liable for the negligence of its independent contractors, being Enma, Five Star, Elgas and Cohen. Five Star, Elgas and Cohen were all found to have acted negligently and were liable in their own rights and the college, being the employer of Hussain, was also found liable um, as it had a non-delegable duty of care and the court said it just didn't matter that they did not hold the relative expertise or knowledge, um, which is a bit tough. So what about apportionment? Now in this case, Enma was not a defendant in the proceedings. Um, Enma had no insurance, um, had gone into uh, insolvency, uh, or rather was insolvent, uh, and we were left with um, the other parties. So the court, when looking at this one, uh, explained the principles of evaluating the comparative responsibility of each defendant. It identified that the relevant considerations are um, to look to the degree of departure of each of those parties from the standard of reasonable care expected of them and the relevance of that in terms of the cause of injury. Um, and in doing so, the court said, well, look, we can't differentiate them. Uh, the party that's primarily responsible, primarily responsible for the explosion uh, isn't a uh, party to the proceedings and we're left with the rest. Therefore, we think that the justice of the case requires that they all equally take responsibility. And that's what occurred there. In the next case of Waco quick form, uh, we have Axis as the principal contractor, engaged Waco 
uh, to install, supply, dismantle scaffolding. Waco contracted with BTSS who supplied labourers. Uh, essentially what occurred was there were some issues um, on the site prior to this injury that caused Waco to take control of the system of work. Uh, they revised the safe work method statement required it to be used by BTSS and it also undertook supervision of the work to ensure that our workers of BTSS were following that safe work method statement. It was high risk work. Um, unfortunately, the plaintiff was injured when he fell eight metres while dismantling the scaffolding. Um, in that case, um, both BTSS and Waco were found liable for plaintiff's injuries. And the apportionment that the court determined was Waco 75% being the, the principal contractor in that arrangement and BTS the employer uh, 25%. The reasoning for this is that Waco had assumed that primary responsibility, um, taking it away from BTSS on that site. Um, so they therefore suffered the, the large apportionment of liability. Access wasn't a defendant the proceeding, um, but there was really little criticism of their conduct by the court. The next case is a matter of Coote and Terry's crane hire. Mr Coote was seriously injured when he fell three metres through a skylight. Um, in this matter, Coote was not very experienced. He didn't receive any training from his employer. The employer didn't carry out a site inspection and gave him no instructions. Frontline was the principal contractor. They were aware of the skylight, uh, but uh, didn't notify the employer. They did notify another subcontractor on the site, who then notified the plaintiff. Uh, but the court determined that the principal contractor, Frontline, did fail to take reasonable care by not retaining a supervisory power, which would have resulted in steps being taken to better assure the safety of the plaintiff. Um, Frontline was also convicted under the Western Australia Occupational Health and Safety Laws. The apportionment in that case was 40% uh, Frontline and 60% to the employer. Um, now this was uh, appealed by Frontline and the Court of Appeal considered um, the apportionment to determine whether that whether it was reasonable. They, they understood that the um, primary judge's assessment considered that the employer was primarily, primarily um, uh, responsible for the safety of the plaintiff, whereas Frontline was responsible for the state of the premises. They found no reason to overturn that assessment and considered it reasonable in the circumstances. Next, the next case is Hallmark Construction and Harford. Um, a large uh, building site. Uh, the principal was a truck driver for Harford Transport, his own company. Hallmark Constructions was the principal contractor, subcontracted to Copeland, who was the bricklayer, uh, the bricklaying company. A&M supplied a site supervisor uh, to Copeland. Uh, Copeland engaged truck driver uh, to deliver the concrete blocks. Unfortunately, when um, uh, Mr. Harford delivered the blocks, a Pallet was covering a retention pit, uh, pit. He went to go move that out of the way and fell into the retention pit and suffered quite bad injuries. Um, the court found both uh, Copeland and Hallmark were occupiers and had retained control over the building site and the system of work and had failed in that respect. Um, they, Copeland was precariously liable for the negligence of the site supervisor uh, because Copeland, um, although uh, a contractor, although, I'm sorry, Mr. Azai was a, an employee of another company, Copeland was controlling his duties and had confirmed, conferred authority to him. Uh, Copeland was vicariously liable, therefore the employer A&M could not be found vicariously liable for the site supervisor. Um, Harford Transport, as the employer of the injured worker, had not breached its duty to the plaintiff, essentially court determined that it, they could not see what the employer could have done in the circumstances to avoid the injury uh, to uh, Mr Harford. The apportionment of liability was between both um, Copeland and ha uh, Hallmark. Hallmark is the principal contractor, 25%, and Copeland is the head subcontractor, 75%. Uh, the reasoning was essentially the greater degree of control exercised by Copeland um, over the building site and the system of work. So that brings us to the end of it, those cases um, with the apportionments. I know we're running a bit short on time, but quite quickly, when the duty of principal will, uh, a duty of a principal contractor will arise, will be in those circumstances, as per those cases, um, where, um, where we're creating the risk as a principal contractor, you must have consideration to the nature of the work, and that will then dictate what duties might arise. 
Um, yes, it can be delegated if it's reasonable to do so to independent contractors who are competent uh, to control the system of work. Coordination activities may be required um, if it creates a risk of injury if coordination is not provided. Um, it does not extend to constant supervision um, where a principal contractor retains control of the system of work or introduces a dangerous substance um, or uh, um, otherwise has a, another obligation to ensure that other parties uh, are not affected by its uh, activities and non-delegable duty may arise. And once becoming party to a knowledge of a particular risk, um, a principal contractor may also have a duty to take certain actions in response to that risk um, subject uh, to the type of risk that arises. In the uh, factors relevant to apportionment, it seems to me that it really comes down to the degree of control um, of each party and the nature of the duty owed by those parties. Um, those two factors that will be considered by the court, which is the degree of departure from the standard reasonable care and the relative uh, causative potency of the specified act or omission um, are the two factors that the court will always look at. And, and that will really dictate um, having regard to the duties owed by the parties and the control exercise, uh, who bears the burden um, in terms of those apportionments. So overall, um, we've just got a couple of comments here. It's clear that um, the courts don't always consider apportionment. Um, you know, why is that? Uh, usually it's often agreed between the defendants prior to trial. Um, there's a lot of uh, cost uh, saved uh, amongst defendants by doing that. Um, and so therefore it's not always discussed uh, by the court. In a lot of cases, you'll see that a particular uh, plaintiff didn't, did not pursue the employer or another independent contractor for damages um, who otherwise appears to be the party that's primarily responsible. And the reasons for that are usually because that party does not have the means to meet a judgment you know, by insolvency um, or un they're just generally uninsured. Or it might be that there's legislative restrictions on recovery against an employer in some jurisdictions um, that come to fruition. It's important also to realise that the defendants who are found liable for a plaintiff's injury are jointly and severally liable. This means that each defendant is individually responsible for the whole of the judgment, irrespective of whether they are the primary wrongdoer. Um, if the primary wrongdoer is unable to respond to the claim, for example, in Hussain um, and that college uh, case, um, then the remaining wrongdoers will be left to satisfy the judgment. And that's all I've got. Too easy. Well, it's a lot of content. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kim and Pat, for your time today. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions, given that you gave such a thorough and interesting presentation. So sad. <laughs> So, uh, thank you, um, Kim and Pat. You have driven down from Toowoomba today to um, help us present this webinar. So we do appreciate your time and efforts um, in preparing the webinar and, and driving to us um, and to our audience. Thank you again for tuning in this morning. As mentioned earlier, it is um, this session will be recorded and we'll send out a link to you by early next week. Um, you'll also be able to find it on our YouTube channel and on our WorkSafe website. That's all from us here today at Work Cover Queensland. If this is your first webinar with us, thank you. And be sure to tune in next year when we'll have another series of common law webinars kicking off from early February 2021. Sounds a bit weird to say that. So thank you, stay safe and have a great rest of your day.